Right, uh, good afternoon everyone. Thank you all for coming back after lunch uh, to hear about Milosaurus. I'm going to say right at the start, I am perfectly happy with photos and tweeters. I don't have the tweeter, so you can insult me as much as you like. So synapsids, the mammal line amniotes, dominated terrestrial ecosystems during the late Carboniferous and the Permian. During the Pennsylvanian and the Ciceralian, the early Permian, it was this paraphyletic grade of six families known as pelicosaurs that were particularly diverse and abundant. The pelicosaurs include all synapsids that are not therapsids, the therapsids being the lineage that survived into the present day as mammals. The pelicosaurs give us some of the earliest evidence in amniotes of macropredation, including the sphenacodontids here, such as the toy maker's favorite dimetrodon. They give us some of the earliest evidence in amniotes of high fiber herbivory, Edaphosaurus here, the other famous sailback. The varanopids, a family of small to medium sized carnivores and insectivores, give us some of the earliest evidence in terrestrial vertebrates of group living. Uh, we have this lovely fossil from South Africa with an adult and four juveniles, possibly living together in a burrow. And we have two families of pelicosaurs that have at least been suggested to have made the transition back to water, the Ophiacodontids and the herbivorous caseids, although in both cases this is extremely uncertain. <laughs> um, now, given their importance in early terrestrial ecosystems, it is vital that we have a good handle on pelicosaur taxonomy and evolution. And there lies something of a problem. Pelicosaur taxonomy is extremely out of date. When we look at the species currently considered valid, uh, we see most of them were named in the period between the 1930s and the 1970s, a time when classification was often based on body size and stratigraphic age, and the specimen being found in Oklahoma instead of Texas. So while there have been efforts in recent years to revise pelicosaur taxonomy, there remains much to do. With that said, on to our subject for today. Melosaurus McCordy, uh, named by Robert DeMar in 1970, based on some postcranial material from Illinois. The specimen hails from the Mattoon Formation, which is a roughly Xellian age, the last stage of the uh, Carboniferous. Melosaurus was assigned to the Varanopidae, uh, now, at that time, varanopids were considered transitional between the primitive Ophiacodontian pelicosaurs and the derived Sphenacodontids. So in making this assignment, Damar described several characters that Melosaurus shared with Sphenacodontids and several plesiomorphic characters. In more recent years, however, with the introduction of cladistics, this classification scheme has been overturned. Varanopids are no longer considered closely related to Sphenacodontids. The characters previously used to unite them are deemed to have been acquired convergently. Through all this, though, Melosaurus was largely ignored. It was only once very recently included in a phylogenetic analysis by Freddy Schwindler. Uh, his matrix focused mainly on the Varanopids, but included a fair smattering of other pelicosaurs, and Melosaurus came out as an Ophiacodontid. That was a position that was never before suggested for it, um, and there are some problems with their scorings of Melosaurus. Uh, they were based primarily on the drawings in the original description and included the non-holotype material. Both of these facts, as we will soon see, are extremely problematic. Now, what attracted me towards going to have a look at Melosaurus was this drawing in the original description of a femur. Femurs are a good bone to have for pelicosaurs. Uh, there's lots of good characters in there, and this femur looks positively beautiful compared to some of the scrap we have from other Carboniferous pelicosaurs. So you can imagine my consternation when I arrived in Chicago and was presented with that. I spent probably an inordinate amount of time trying to work out whether I was looking at the right bone, uh, even allowing for the fact that the artist might have been trying to reconstruct rather than draw accurately. The two are completely differently proportioned. This long, slender shaft, quite characteristic of varanopids, is not there. The prominent adductor crest is not there, and nor is there really any evidence of damage or erosion that can account for its absence. I eventually decided that this was the correct holotype femur, based primarily on the morphology of the distal end. The anterior condyle is broad and slightly flattened. Uh, that's a morphology that's evolved a couple of times in pelicosaurs. But the posterior condyle is pretty unique from what I've seen. In most pelicosaurs, this is a bulbous condyle, a sort of half sphere shape. Uh, but Melosaurus's is a sort of cylinder shape. It's got a flat distal end. And we see this morphology in the original drawing, although the more eagle-eyed of you may note that the drawing appears to be a mirror of the bone. Uh, the actual femur in the drawer is a right femur. 
I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if the artist was trying to draw it from memory or if uh, there was an error in whatever the 1970s equivalent of a photocopier is. Uh, but for the present, I'm working on the basis that this is the correct holotype femur. So along with the uh, unusual distal morphology, uh, the unusual prominence of the internal trochanter is uh, quite characteristic of Melosaurus. We have a uh, caudal series, uh, about 30 vertebrae. There's some gaps preserved. Uh, this is the anteriormost portion of the caudal series. We have also a sacral neural spine and part of an ischium. This has been shifted and rotated slightly. So up here is the uh, distal end, the posterior end. And it's this ischium that gives us one of the better clues as to what Melosaurus actually is. Uh, in most pelicosaurs, the ischium tapers as you go distally, but in Melosaurus, it appears to be expanding. That's quite a good character of the Sphenacomorpha, the clade that contains the Edaphosaurids and the Sphenacodontids. Also supporting this assignment are the unusually short caudal ribs uh, that barely extend posteriorly beyond the posterior limit of their vertebra. We have a left pairs, uh, a few bits missing, and the proximal ends of the astragalus and the calcaneum have been cracked away from the main body. We can still see a couple of good characters in there. Uh, the astragalus is the classic L shape of pelicosaurs, a uh, broad body and a narrow neck. The neck is quite long relative to the body, and the calcaneum is longer than it is broad. Both of these were characters that were in the past used to unite uh, Sphenacodontids and Varanopids in the old 1940s to 1980s classification scheme, but no longer. Some other postcranial fragments. There's a dorsal ilium process uh, that was figured in the original uh, description, and in a box labeled associated fragments, I found part of a radius and part of a pubis. All of this is uh, pretty plesiomorphic. Uh, the pubis actually gives us one of the better indications that this is not, as was thought by Freddy Spindler and Ophiacodontid. This lateral boss that you can see here is dorsally orientated in Ophiacodontids. So, uh, along with the holotype, four specimens were assigned by Demar to Melosaurus. Two of these have since been lost, uh, the maxillary teeth and a neural arch that wasn't even figured in the original description. We still have a dorsal vertebra and what was originally described as a dorsal rib. Now, none of this material actually overlapped with the holotype. They were assigned to Melosaurus based on them being of roughly the right size and Melosaurus at that time being the only pelicosaur known from that locality. I see no reason to assign them to Melosaurus and will not be discussing them further with the exception of the rib. And we'll start by saying that it's actually a femur. Um, it's a bit difficult to see with this material smushed into the distal end, but it actually has the same distal morphology as Melosaurus. The broad, slightly flattened anterior condyle and the cylindrical posterior condyle with the flattened distal end. It's about a third of the length of the holotype femur, so it's possibly a juvenile. It's more slender than the holotype femur, but that is consistent with other ontogenetic series we have for pelicosaurs. So extremely tentatively, possibly a juvenile Melosaurus. Phylogenetic analysis, I used the matrix that started out life as Roger Benson's 2012 global pelicosaur phylogeny. This has been through several iterations, adding both taxa and characters. Those that can do quick mental arithmetic will see that it now has 52 taxa and 245 characters. This is the sphenacomorph portion of the resulting tree. Uh, the sphenacomorph, as I said, contain the edaphosaurids, the sphenacodontids, and the therapsids. The therapsids, the lineage that eventually goes on to give us mammals. Melosaurus comes out as the immediate outgroup to the Sphenacomorpha. It's in a polytomy with Ianthodon. Uh, unfortunately, we can't resolve this polytomy any further as there's no overlap in the material we have for these two taxa. Very sad and all that, but such is life. And for those of you who eschew parsimony analysis, Bayesian analysis finds the same position for Melosaurus. So given its phylogenetic position, there is one aspect of Melosaurus's morphology that warrants further discussion, and that is its large size. Using the vertebral proportions, it was estimated at 41 kilograms, which would put it as one of the largest Carboniferous synapsids we currently have. Now, earlier this year, Kirsten Brink and myself looked at body size evolution in the Sphenacomorphs. We identified two very rapid increases in body size towards the end of the Carboniferous, one leading up to the herbivorous members of the Edaphosaurids, the lineage is in green, and the other leading up to the large macrocarnivorous Sphenacodontids. 
Uh, at 41 kilograms, Mulosaurus could represent a third carboniferous increase in body size, an independent increase, or it could overturn this hypothesis. This is a small data set. Small data sets are vulnerable to the influence of single taxa. So I added Mulosaurus to the composite tree used in this study, and I repeated the analyses. The analyses are based on the variable rates model of Venditti et al. Uh, this model starts with Brownian motion as its base. Uh, Brownian motion is the random walk. The uh, trait shows no selection in any particular direction and no rate variation. If we incorporate rate variation, we see the amount of variance along each lineage changes. So here I've decreased the rates of the red lineages and you see they show considerably less variation than the black lineages. So Venditti et al. used a Markov chain Monte Carlo method to identify the pattern of rate variation that best fit the observed phylogeny and trait data. Uh, this was done in the program Bayes Traits. Uh, so here are the uh, rates of body size evolution uh, shown as a heat map. Hot colors indicate high rates. And we see the same two rate increases that were identified before. We have this red lineage up here leading up to the herbivorous members of the Adaphosaurids and this sort of pinky purple lineage here leading up to the large predatory Sphenacodontids. Mulosaurus shows no evidence of an uh, increase in rates. Uh, its evolution is within the bounds of what would be expected by Brownian motion. Doing ancestral state reconstruction, rescaling the branches to represent the rate variation, we see the same two increases we identified before. One leading up to the Sphenacodontids, one leading up to the herbivorous members of the Adaphosaurids. Mulosaurus represents a third independent evolution of body sizes above 40 kilos, although, as I just said, this is considerably slower than the other two. So to sum up, Mulosaurus is the immediate outgroup to the Sphenacomorpha, not a Varanopid, and it evolved its large body size independently of other Carboniferous uh, synapsids. So I would like to thank these people for uh, allowing me access to the specimen, these people for giving me helpful comments and discussion, and of course my very generous funders, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>